Listen to February 1 to 15 Early Morning Devotionals. February 1 Ski Accident A cheerful heart is a good medicine, but a downcast spirit dries up the bells. Proverbs chapter 17 verse 22. During the winter, my husband Larry and I skied almost every day. We strapped on our cross-country skis and puffed up the slopes that border the lake behind our house. We raced down through the trees and sped across the frozen lake. Occasionally, on weekends, we'd head to the mountains for more beautiful scenery and more challenging topography. One Sunday morning, we decided to explore a new trail. Friends would drop us off at the trailhead and we'd ski ever downward to the town of Bumpf where we'd find our car. We skid in blaze of sunshine and then traverse areas of shadows beneath evergreen trees. Ever watchful for patches of ice in this late winter day. And then I slipped. My poles flailing. My skis skidding out of the track. I landed on my face with my sunglasses pushing into my forehead. When dead, I lay for a few moments in the trail. A headache but no broken bones. I wasn't in bad shape. The next few kilometers would be uncomfortable, but certainly possible. Your forehead's bleeding, announced Larry. He pulled off his reflective sunglasses and handed them to me to serve as a mirror. My forehead was cut in two places right above my eyebrows. Where's the first aid kit? We need to get you bandaged up and into the emergency room. I think you'll need stitches. He put two band-aids on my forehead and we headed along the trail, skiing more slowly and carefully. I waited several hours at the Mineral Springs Hospital, feeling rather grouchy. Not only had our beautiful morning been mared, but lunch was delayed. And my head hurt. I felt gloomier and gloomier as the afternoon progressed. I started analyzing the injuries of those around me. With three downhill ski resorts nearby, I was the only one who wasn't in pain because of a broken wrist, arm, or leg. Still, the observation did nothing to lift my spirit. I sat morosely and felt sorry for myself. When I was called in, the doctor removed the band-aids. Suddenly, life was much better. I felt almost happy. Yes, the doctor decided that stitches were unnecessary, but my mood shifted primarily because my eyebrows weren't held down. My face wasn't fixed in a perpetual gloomy expression. I could smile. I realized that a cheerful heart and face are both good medicine. Denise Decker February 2 Any spare salt? 
You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled. Matthew chapter 5 verse 13, New International Version. The plot was thickening and the words flowing smoothly. I was having a good time with a keyboard and smirking at the thought that I had. At this point, outrun that dreaded writer's block. The characters were becoming real until the loudest of knocks on my door threw me off guard. This better be good, I said to myself. Begrudgingly, I moved away from the computer to check who this bad timer was. I hoped it wasn't my neighbor's voice, who had already disturbed me twice that morning kicking their ball over my fence and coming around to knock on my door to ask that I throw it back to them. A discreet peep revealed it was the boy's little sister. I pondered if I should hear her out or continue writing. I assumed her brother had sent her over this time, having sense they had already gotten on my last nerve. Before I made up my mind whether to hear her out or not, she knocked again. I opened the door and forced a smile. Mommy wants to cook something and she has run out of salt. Do you have any spare salt, please? For a moment, I stared at the child, puzzled. She looked me straight in the eye as she said those words. Yes, I do have spare salt, I responded. She came in and waited at the hallway as I made it into the kitchen. Growing up as a young girl, my mom taught me to be sure I always had extra salt in my kitchen cupboards. True to that teaching, I always have one or two extra unopened bottles of salt. I handed the young girl a salt bottle and she left. Three days later, Matthew chapter 5 verse 13 came to mind. God requires me to be the salt of the world. He requires us to be well-seasoned and to mingle, carrying out the purpose to which He has called us. What good are we if we lose our saltiness? Or if we allow our saltiness to be overpowering? Had I ignored the little girl's knock, I would have missed an opportunity to reach out even in the most insignificant way. Our saltiness could be needed by very unlikely people. Yet, there should be no excuse. So my sisters, the question is, Are you too salty? Or are you well seasoned? Do you always have spare salt to share? Kind words you say to someone? Or that little act of kindness you extend to others? Lord, help me to be well seasoned and minister to others. February 3, a cup of water please. Whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. John chapter 4 verse 13, New International Version.
with her head bowed, her eyes partially shielded, barely looking up to check her path. Too afraid she might be noticed, she timidly walked on to her destination. Her mission was to get there where she intended to go and leave as quickly as possible. She was in deep thought, concentrating all her energy on her mission. When suddenly, she was startled by a male voice. Moving her veil ever so slightly, she raised her head, wondering to herself, who could this man possibly be? With her thoughts racing, she thought of the time of the day. Had she miscalculated the time? Was it not high noon? The sixth hour of the day? Would not all the women and girls already have attended to filling their water jars? And yes, she thought, men do not usually come to the well to draw water. It's usually the women and girls. So why is this man here? When she shook herself back to reality and out of her deep thoughts, the woman was astonished to see a man sitting on the edge of the well, asking, May I have a cup of water, please? She looked around. Only the two of them were present at the well. He must be addressing me, she thought. Their eyes met. She caught her gaze. She noticed his features. She noticed his dress. He was not from her tribe. Your dress and your features betray you. You must be a Jew. Can you not tell from my clothing that I am a Samaritan? Yet, here you are, asking me to give you a drink of water from our father's well, Jacob's well. What is it you do not understand about the irony of this situation? The Jews hate us Samaritans so much. They usually spit on the ground when they accidentally come near us. Yet, you asked me, a Samaritan woman, for a cup of water? Christ met her where she was. A flawed woman with a deep spiritual longing. I invite you to join the club of ordinary, flawed, hungry, thirsty people who are drawn by incredible grace and love of Jesus. Like John, the beloved disciple, we also can claim to be the beloved of Jesus. I invite you to drink from the well that never will run dry. The well from which just a cup of water will quench your spiritual thirst and make you whole and fit to spend eternity with the living God. Avis May Rodney February 4, A Long Wait Home Be still and know that I am God. Psalms chapter 46 verse 10 New International Version Being patient is something most of us struggle with. For instance, we are impatient when we have to wait in line at the grocery store or wait for someone to take us somewhere. 
my husband, who is legally sightless, had an appointment for an outpatient procedure at the hospital. His insurance company supplies transportation for doctor's visits, so I called to schedule a ride. The van came and the driver was very nice. When we arrived at our destination, he gave me a card with a toll-free number to call when we were ready to be picked up. My husband's medical procedure took longer than expected, but I had to inform the nurse that we were riding in the insurance van. So I needed to know when I could call for our return trip. She said she would come and let me know when my husband was in recovery. While in the waiting room, I was surprised to see Kay, a fellow church member working at the desk. She saw me and came over and gave me a hug. I had no idea she worked there. After a couple of hours, the nurse came and gave me the okay to call for a ride. I went to the desk and called the number on the card but got only a recording. I waited patiently but after about 7 minutes, I hung up the phone and redialed. I began getting impatient and frustrated as I was still on hold. The secretary saw my frustration and tried to call the number on her phone but to no avail. Now, I was really becoming upset. I asked the secretary if she knew Kay who worked downstairs. She said yes. You go to the same church? Yes, I responded. She continued, Then I'll call Kay and she'll find you a ride home. Don't get upset. When Kay arrived, we told her the situation. She assured me that she had her church directory and would be able to call someone up, pick up my husband and me. I praise God and relaxed. The Lord places people in our path and sometimes we don't always know why. I had no idea that Kay worked at the hospital, but the Lord knew. He knew the need I would have, crossed our path, and through her, provided us a way home with another church member. Here I was, impatient and worried, while the Lord was already working things out. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for Him. Psalms chapter 37 verse 7, New King James Version. Elaine J. Johnson February 5, Our Hope Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and He delivered them out of their distresses. Psalms chapter 107, verse 6, King James Version Which of us has no wounds or scars on the soul? Certainly, the world spares no one. We are marked by pain and afflictions that seems to have no end. Every day, we need to fight against discouragement. And sometimes we fall in this fight. Wounds burn, reminding us that we have limited abilities and need help. Each person at the soul level carries the scars from sin that originated in a ruined world headed for destruction. 
conditions on this planet have worsened to the point where we really cannot expect much quality of life. We are affected by illness, violence, and discouragement, as well as material and emotional needs. The peace and tranquility found in the Garden of Eden no longer exist. Yet, we give glory to the Lord because in the midst of all this chaos, there is a living hope. Jesus will be with us until the end and beyond. His promise is sure. While it assures us that we have help in overcoming our daily struggles with sin, it also reminds us of a new abode of unending peace and happiness being prepared for us. We will live without sorrow or death, pain or suffering. Despite this world's pain, we have a certainty in our hearts that God created us to be happy and at His side. What we see, hear, and do in this world of suffering does not have a function. However, to keep alive the flame of hope in the promises of Jesus. The afflictions that are part of our lives now are only intruders in what God originally created on and for this world. We know that in a better world God is preparing for His children, no evil will ever enter. Because we women are sometimes more emotional than reasoning, it is easy to become discouraged when facing life's challenges. Being sensitive, we often shed tears. Yet, on this final journey, we must believe and trust in the words of our Savior. He will keep us walk on the right path and not lose our way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. John chapter 14 verse 6 Only He can help us through our tribulations and steady our steps. Therefore, dear friends, when trouble come upon you, look up. God loves you with an everlasting love. Only in Him will you find hope and lasting security. Sueli da Selva Ferreira February 6, So, and it shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer, and while they are yet speaking, I will hear. Isaiah chapter 65 verse 24, King James Version There is an international program called Days for Girls, which provides feminine hygiene supplies to young girls. I have been involved with the project for a couple of years now. My supplies have gone primarily to the girls in refugee camps in Africa. Most every girl and woman everywhere has something in common, a monthly menstrual cycle. Many countries are blessed with adequate means to deal with this area of female life. However, there are places where normal activities almost come to a standstill during the few days of menstruation. When hygiene supplies are made available, it is life-changing for young girls who can continue to go to school all month long instead of missing several days. Days for Girls volunteers supply needed items along with a washcloth and a small bar of soap. I have asked motel proprietors if they could consider either donating or selling me a few bars of soap for this special project. 
A friend of mine and her husband recently took a trip to a distant city. Jenny, being interested in my project, asked the motel clerk where they stayed if she could buy 10 to 12 small bars of soap. The clerk responded, how would you like a whole case? Jenny exclaimed, a whole case? Then the clerk explained that the motel had recently changed brands and they didn't need the case of soap they had been using. Jenny took the case of soap to her motel room and tried to figure out how to get it home. She removed clothes from her suitcase, placed them in a carry-on bag, and crammed both suitcases full of soap. When they arrived at the airport, the airline check-in clerk asked why Jenny's suitcase was so heavy. With green, her husband responded, Soap. The clerk exclaimed, Soap? And they laughed. Then, Jenny briefly explained that the soap was for a missionary project. The lady said that she too had done some missionary work in the past and gladly waived the $40 excess baggage fee. Back home, I was very surprised when Jenny presented me over a thousand small bars of soap, all of which will bless many girls in distant lands. God definitely helped with my project, answering before I even asked. What a mighty God we serve. Mary Beth Giselle February 7. Hear my prayer. When my rock is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Psalms chapter 61 verse 2 King James Version The Lord never leaves nor forsakes us. He hears our prayer. Have you felt hopeless, lonely, and as if you were in the dark alone? I have had these feelings and more, but God has always shown me, one way or another, that He is working things out for me and that it will be okay. In 1984, I was a teenager in Jamaica trying to find my sister. She lived in a rural area in St. James and I was visiting her from Westmoreland. I got on a bus whose road led down a lonely, dark road. Suddenly, we passengers saw some type of activity on the road ahead. A major accident had occurred. Our bus had to stop. Everyone will have to walk from here, the driver announced. I did not know anyone on the bus or how to get back home or to my sister's house. I murmured to myself, how will I ever find where she lives? Where who lives? Asked the young man seated beside me. When I told him my sister's name, he responded, Oh, I know her. She just moved to a house in my area. I could not believe what I was hearing. On a bus full of strangers, the person sitting next to me knew my sister. The young man held my arm in the crook of his big warm arm and began walking with me for over three hours. The time it took to arrive finally at my sister's house. Though the man was twice my size and height, I was not scared. I felt safe holding his hand although I did not know his name. 
he led me to my sister's house. Today, if you feel as if you are lost in the dark, please remember that God hears your prayer. He has angels on each corner along your journey. When your heart is overwhelmed, He will lead you to the rock that is higher than yourself. So please pray with me now. Dear God, open our eyes to see your blessings. Focus our attention on your love. Hide the fears and doubts that haunt us and lead us to the rock that is higher than we are. Amen. Now, accept God's answer and flourish in His loving embrace. Pauline E. Robinson February 8. Count Your Blessings in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18, King James Version. I was completing my master's degree in the United Kingdom. I was homesick, mostly because I missed my only child. In an effort to relieve my distress, I spoke of him whenever possible. While speaking to one of my colleagues during a diabetic clinic, I emphasized how much I enjoyed raising my son and proceeded to lament the fact that I had only one child. My colleague was quiet for a moment then told me of how long he and his wife had tried to have a child and how difficult it had been to accept that it was medically impossible. I apologized. The next day, I was asked by another colleague about my children at home and how I was coping. I responded that I missed my son dearly. She then asked if I only had just the one. I was quick to answer that although I had tried to have a pair of children, I had only managed to have one living child. I told her of my medical condition which had affected my childbearing ability and how sad this had made me. I was startled by her calm response. She said, You're lucky. I couldn't have any. I almost bowed my head in shame. Again, I apologized for being insensitive. I left the hospital that day feeling very cruel and ungrateful. In two days, I had met two people with no children. Two people, however, who were still cheerful. I thought of how I must have hurt God by constantly lamenting the fact that I had only one child. I had been so selfish and ungrateful. I thought of how much better it would be to constantly thank Him for a normal, healthy child, indeed a gift from God. Although I was away from home, God had taught me a valuable lesson in gratefulness. How often do we complain about what God does or doesn't give to us? Yet, there are others around us who have so much less. They continue to be blessings to others anyway and do not cease to smile. Today, let us take time to thank God for our many blessings. Indeed, He had done great things. 
Shanasar Felbert. February 9. Don't stop what you're doing. So let's not get tired of doing what is good. At just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. Galatians chapter 6 verse 9. Once a week at work, we have a meeting with our whole team. This is the time when the team is briefed. We also have a peer share exchanging pertinent work-related information. I'm a creature of habit. My topics to share usually come from some interesting article that I've read in the New York Times, generally dealing with finances that are applicable to our business or team members. One morning, as I prepared to find an article, I had a discouraging thought. All your shares are from the Times. Why don't you do something different? So I gave up searching for my would be article and went to the meeting with nothing to share. As the meeting progressed, the partner said, I won't share everything because I'm sure some of you will have the same share. I'm usually first to share, but responded that today I had nothing for the team. He was surprised that I had not brought an article that he had read for what would have been my usual share. You see, he had even dubbed me Queen of the New York Times, but not in a bad way. He had come expecting me because of my usual routine to be the one to share about this interesting article which he proceeded to discuss. I sat there and half smiled at myself, though thinking that my contribution were going unnoticed, I had created a reputation for finding and sharing articles of interest related to our profession. Is there something you keep doing but think your efforts aren't being noticed? Keep doing it anyway. Twice yesterday, I came across this verse. Whatever your hands finds to do, do it with your mind. Ecclesiastes chapter 9 verse 10 Friends, while it may feel discouraging at times because you think your efforts are not being noticed, don't give up. You have a very important role to play no matter how unimportant you may feel it is. God has a way of multiplying things when we place them in His hands. Lord, please forgive us for believing that what you have asked us to do is inadequate. Please strengthen us and empower us to do whatever it is you have given us to do. Please encourage us along our journey so that we may know that we are on the right path, doing the work to which you have called us. Keishan Garden February 10, Heavens 911. When he calls in me, I will answer. I will be with him in trouble and rescue him and honor him. I will satisfy him with a full life and give him my salvation. Psalms chapter 91, verse 15 and 16. A contemporary Christian singer, Eddie Digamo, sings a song titled, Heaven's 911. It tells a person heading down his life's highway in the wrong direction. Then the person realizes he can call on Jesus any time of the day by offering a quick prayer. We too can have a direct line to Jesus 
anytime, anywhere, and at any place. Jesus knows our needs and wants even before we asked. He is waiting for us to come to Him and tell Him the desires of our hearts. My friend Joyce, a diabetic who lives alone, wears an emergency safety button. If Joyce should fall or have a medical emergency, she can simply push the button. Someone will immediately contact her to see if she's okay, needs an ambulance dispatch to come to her aid, or needs her son to be contacted to come and help. This emergency button option is reassuring not only for Joyce but also for her loved ones, knowing that she can summon help. Have you ever wanted to talk to someone important? Perhaps the president of a school or a bank or even the United States. You may have had something important on your mind and you wanted to get advice or offer a suggestion. But you know it would be nearly impossible to reach that person. Maybe you just wanted to meet a celebrity. There was a young actor from a children's movie whom my oldest son resembled. Once I asked my son, about 10 years of age at a time, to stand by the television. I stopped the movie on a close-up of the young actor that my son resembled. I took a picture of the both of them and submitted it to the movie company. A few weeks later, I received a reply from the company, a form letter inviting us to join this young actor's fan club, but it made no mention of my son's resemblance to the young actor. On this earth, we may not be able to have a direct connection with everyone we wish. However, we can have a direct connection with God and His Son, Jesus Christ, our Creator and the King of the Universe. I know it's hard to fathom or imagine that when we get to heaven, we will communicate with Him face to face, having no more need for 911 calls. I like to make lists. Perhaps I will make a list of topics that I want to discuss with him when I met him on the sea of glass. How great that was. Galmon Bateman February 11, Paying Our Debts it is better not to make a vow than to make one and not fulfill it. Ecclesiastes chapter 5 verse 5, New International Version. We live in a world where some people's word has been losing its value. Think about your life. How many times have you promised to do something for people? Then try to recall how many of these promises you have actually fulfilled. And how many times have people who made promises to you actually kept their word? Toward the end of his life, during a time of contemplation and reflection, King Solomon wrote, it is better not to make a vow than to make one and will not fulfill it. His father David had written earlier that among those who will stand firm forever are people who have kept their promises. Psalms chapter 5 verse 4. In other words, they made good on their word. As human beings, we can control whether or not we stand behind our word. 
If we don't, though, we lose credibility and the respect of others. People view us as being untrustworthy. And here's a further thought. If keeping our promises to others is important, how much more careful should we be when making promises to God? When we are requesting God's help during times of anxiety or fear, we sometimes promise to do something in return. Yet, how often have we forgotten to follow through on those promises to the Savior? But God does not forget. He wants us to fulfill what we have promised. As Solomon wrote, when you make a vow to God, do not delay to fulfill it. Ecclesiastes chapter 5 verse 4 In this verse, the admonition to fulfill a promise takes on the meaning of paying a debt that we owe. So when we promise something either to God or another person, we assume a debt in a sense. And as such, since we have committed to assume this debt, we need to pay it. Jesus once told a parable of two sons that a householder asked to work in his vineyard. The first son said he wouldn't but change his mind and went to work. The second son promised to work but did not make good on his word. Jesus implied that the son who did not fulfill his promise did not pay his debt, did not do the will of his father. As we promise and are careful to pay our temporal debts, should we not take our promise to God and others with the same seriousness? In God's strength, we can make good on our word. Cecilia Nani February 12, The Kindness of a Stranger Whoever is kind to the poor is lending to the Lord. The benefit of his gift will return to him in abundance. Proverbs chapter 19, verse 17 In 1979, I was traveling from Manila to Addis Ababa, the capital of Ethiopia, where my husband and I serve as missionaries. There was a 30-hour layover in Bombay, former name of Mumbai, India, before I could board the Ethiopian Airlines flight for the last leg of my trip. As I sat in the corner of the airport observing the busy activities around me, I saw a middle-aged lady sitting alone. There was a worried look on her face that showed something was wrong. Curiously, I approached her. In limited English, she related her sad story. She worked as domestic help for a family in Saudi Arabia. Unfortunately, she became sick and the family decided to send her back to Sri Lanka via Bombay. Unknowingly, the ticket did not include the connecting flight to her final destination. She was stranded in Bombay indefinitely. For several days, she had begged passengers for money to purchase a ticket to Sri Lanka. I thought of helping her but did not have the courage to approach people and beg. I gave her my last dollar and prayed that I would not need anything before I reached home. Before I settled on my makeshift bed of airport chairs, I knelt to thank God for His protection and the company of a new friend. Suddenly, I hear the voice asking, Filipina ka ba? Are you a Filipina? I look around to see who asked the question. 
Seated nearby was an Arab gentleman. In the course of our conversation, he mentioned that he was on his way back to Saudi Arabia from a business trip in Manila. I introduced my friend and mentioned her sad predicament. Upon hearing her story, this kind stranger handed me money and instructed me to purchase for her a ticket to Sri Lanka. My new friend could not contain her happiness. Finally, she was going home, thanks to the kindness of a stranger. I am reminded of Christ's words. Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of this, my brethren, you did it to me. Matthew chapter 25 verse 20 the next day, I bade farewell to my new friends as they boarded the plane to their respective destinations. I was alone again, but not for long. I too was going home. Evelyn Fortessa Tabingo I would love to hear from you. Comment down below your thoughts about this devotion. February 13, Praying for Strangers. Pray without ceasing. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17, New King James Version. Every day I pray for strangers. It sets the stage for new friendships. Let me explain about my prayer. I decided long ago to ask God to be the one to lead me to France. This is my prayer. Thank you, Lord, for the stranger that I'm yet to meet, one who will become my friend. As a result, my friendship coffer overflows. Life is short. We can't choose our birth family, but we can choose our friends. A young friend said that to me the day after I prayed with her mother in the hospital following her father's unexpected death. She and her husband were two strangers from whom I had prayed before we even met, the same as with her parents. It's always wonderful to meet the people God brings into my life, like precious gifts. My husband and I returned to Florida in 2014 after being away for four and a half years. Though we've acquired many fine friends and enjoyed nice experiences while living other places, I long for Florida. I'm one of those people affected by seasonal affective disorder, also referred to as SAD. There aren't many gray days in Florida. Even the almost daily summer rain showers are followed by brilliant sunshine. One of the delights upon our return was the frequent flow of visit from our Florida friends, welcoming us back to the Sunshine State as well as our many snowbird friends. Does pray without ceasing mean do nothing except pray 24 hours a day? We'd probably be hold off for a psychiatrist evaluation if we did. What it does mean is that we maintain an attitude of prayer, knowing that God's listening ear is with us. Many days are better because of friends. They add to my wholeness as a person and are a blessing. My husband and I prayed for those friends and continue to pray for them. They are an extension of our family. Elizabeth Kobler-Ross, a world-renowned psychiatrist, had it right when she compared people to stained glass windows. 
They sparkle and shine when the sun is out, but when the darkness sets in, their true beauty is revealed only if there is a light from within. Thus, let us pray for strangers, for, in so doing, they become the ones who we call individually my friend. Betty Caustic Know us by our love. A new command I gave you, love one another. As I have loved you, you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35, New International Version. Where are you going? Karine, the glass instructor, asked a fellow member of our class. The question drew my attention. I turn into the direction of her voice. Then, I look at the soft-spoken student. That day, she appeared to have spent more time than usual on her appearance and was wearing carefully applied makeup that enhanced her features. I did not hear the student's soft-spoken answer to the instructor's question. Later that day, however, a spiritual parallel dawned in my mind. I reflected how Karine's attention had been drawn to her student's appearance, which suggested that she intended to go somewhere important after class. Likewise, as followers of Christ, should look as if we are going somewhere important, and we are. Heaven. People should know that we are Christ's disciples and ambassadors before we even speak a word. How can they know that? Because we are wearing something every day that much better than makeup. We are wearing love. Jesus told his disciples, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. John chapter 13, verse 35 God calls us to show agape love to everyone. People should look at us and notice something different. That we have love for one another. That love should envelop everyone we met in heartwarming ways, in action and words of kindness. When others know us by our love, they will want to connect with the source of our love, God. When we witness with love, we share hope. We are living testimonies that this world is not our home. We are walking reminders that we are going somewhere important, heaven. Our love will inspire others to love and follow God and among the faithful followers that He, when the time comes, will take to heaven. The Bible says that we are pilgrims here on this earth and advises us to store up our treasures in heaven, not on this planet. So let us live like we're loved by God. And let us show His love to everyone we met. Alexis A. Kari Coming to my rescue For I am the Holy God of Israel who saves you, because you are precious to me. Isaiah chapter 43, verse 3 and 4. Quilling breaks and the thud of a slammed car door followed by an angry bellowing male voice abruptly drawn out our quiet conversations. The usual laughter and pleasantries of church potluck vanished. Furious accusations escalated into violent shoving. 
the recipient of the anger, a tiny teenager, tried unsuccessfully to escape her accoster. From my distant vantage point, I was too far away to protect her. Racing into the community room, I frantically searched for the father of the team. A young man is yelling and pushing your daughter in the breezeway, I exclaimed. That was all he needed to hear. The father asked no questions. With coattails flying and brown shoes beating the ceramic tiles, this usually reserved giant of a man was out of the door in a flash. There was no time to waste. His precious daughter was in danger. And that's when I caught a new picture of God. As a child, I often gaze at a picture of Jesus, the Good Shepherd, inching his way over the ground on his stomach. With outstretched arms, he is reaching for his lost lamb, quivering on a narrow ledge of a steep precipice. I always imagine a slowly moving shepherd, quietly taking his time so as not to frighten the lamb. But in this moment, I saw God's fierce reaction to the sound of my cries for help. Gone are the slow, cautious movement. He drops everything. He snatches up the hem of his robe as his sandals fly across the pavement. God races to my rescue. When I cry to him, he responds instantly and without hesitation. It doesn't matter whether my choices are the cause of my problems or not. That can be sorted out later. What does matter is his rescuing me from imminent danger just as that father rescued his daughter that day in the church breezeway. It is this new picture of my heavenly father running immediately to my aid that I will remember. When problems envelop me, when dangers overwhelms me, when the enemy seems to outdistance me, I can be sure that God is my rescuer. Judy Ann Neal I would love to hear from you. Comment down below your thoughts about this devotion.